The presidential election later this fall in Argentina has sparked debates as to whether or not the country should dollarize in order to fix its hyperinflation problem. This is on the platform of candidate Javier Millet, who is calling for not just dollarization, but also the abolishment of the central bank. We're here to discuss whether or not this will actually work with our next guest, who has actually been instrumental in implementing dollarization in several countries throughout his career and combating hyperinflation. He is, of course, Steve Hankey, Professor of Applied Economics at Johns Hopkins University. Welcome back to the show, Professor. Always good to host you. Great to be with you, David. I think before we talk about the issue of dollarization itself, we should give the audience a bit of background in terms of your involvement on uh, or in dollarization, not just in Latin America, but other parts of the world. Um, as far back as 1999, the uh, then Argentine president, Carlos Menem, has what was thinking about dollarizing. It never happened. You were intimately involved in this process. Tell us about, first of all, why Menem didn't do it back in 1999 and how things could have been different had he had done it. Well, it, uh, let, let's actually jump back to 1989 because that's when I first met Carlos Menem. He'd just been elected president. And Argentina had a hyperinflation at that time, and, and he wanted my advice on that. And I told him I thought the best way to solve it at that time was a currency board. Now, a currency board, you, you would issue the peso, and, and you would link the peso in a fixed exchange rate with the U.S. dollar, and you would have 100% U.S. dollar reserves backing it up, and and. He said, he said, well, that sounds great. He said, could you write this up? So Kurt Schuler and I wrote a book on this. It was published in Buenos Aires. And, and, and we're part of what a debate and, 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 and ultimately a new system that was put in in April of 1991 called the convertibility system. And it looked a lot like a currency board, but it, it, it had a lot of loopholes in it. And a lot of monetary discretion was allowed in it. It turned out it, it worked very well. It crushed hyperinflation and it lasted for 10 years. And they had a 10 year boom in Argentina due to the convertibility system. But at the end, something I predicted would happen way back in 1991, right after it was introduced, I, I wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal saying, there's so many loopholes in this law and there's so much discretion allowed for the central bank that would not be allowed with the currency board because the currency board, you have no monetary policy. You have an exchange rate policy and that, that's it. There, there's no discretion allowed. Convertibility allowed a lot of discretion and, and loopholes and so forth that were big enough to drive a truck through. And in the end, I predicted what would happen was the thing would collapse. And I, I wrote about this I, in the Wall Street very soon after, I think my article appeared in October of 1991 and the, the system was introduced in April of 1991. At any rate, that's the system they had. And most people are, are, are very confused about that because they think convertibility was a currency board. No, it wasn't a currency board. And uh, it and and by the way, its performance was pretty good for Argentina. They had ten great years with the convertibility system. Then then the thing broke down in two thousand and one, and and they they've been in hell ever since. And what about nineteen ninety nine? That that Menem was still president, and Menem asked. You know what should we be, we be doing now? It looks like they're getting us into a corner. And I, I said well, you should be dollarizing. I said you should you should mothball the central bank and the peso and put them in a museum. And 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 he said fine. Could you write up a, a draft law for that? So Kurt Schuler and I did do that. In 1999. He never pulled the trigger on it. He, he threatened to do it, and unfortunately, he didn't do it. Why exactly he didn't do it, I, I don't know. You ask why didn't he do it, and I, 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 I can't tell you all the particulars of why he didn't do it. He didn't do it. The Bankers Association was all for it. There, were, there was a lot of uh, enthusiasm at that time 
to do it, it would have been quite easy to actually do. It, they didn't do it. They didn't do it. They, they've been in one crisis after another since then with currencies. If you look, by the way, uh, at, at the inflation rate, I'm measuring it today. It's 164% per, per year in Argentina right now. And since, since Fernandez and the Peronistas took over in December, of 2019, the pesos depreciated by 90.7%. I mean, it, it's essentially been trashed. And if you look even since January of January 1st, 2022, it's lost 71.5% of its value. So we're talking about a junk currency here. And, and the idea is with dollarization, of course, you replace the junk currency with the U.S. dollar. You know, my involvement there, incidentally, in 1995, in the middle of, of this boom in Argentina with the convertibility system, I, I was president of Toronto Trust Argentina in Buenos Aires, and, and that was the world's best performing mutual fund in 1990, 1995. So it, it, as, as they say in the markets, I, I've been there, done that, walk the walk, all, all of this kind of stuff. Well, one of the things that uh, Millet, so anyway, well, we're having this conversation because uh, the issue has been brought up once again. Um, the Argentinian election is happening in two months from now. One of the candidates, Javier Millet, a uh, conservative candidate, he wants to dollarize, which is why we're having this conversation. Um, I, I believe he's one of the only candidates who wants to do this, but he doesn't want to just dollarize. He wants to abolish the central bank which is something else that you've already mentioned. Tell us, why does abolishing the central bank help with fighting hyperinflation? Well, when you dollarize, I mean, you might have a central bank. They have a central bank, by the way, in Montenegro. But what do they use? They don't have a local currency. They have no monetary policy. They have no monetary capacity. So the central bank is kind of a shell in the sense, it, 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 it's it's kind of shall we say it's kind of like castration. You 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 take the monetary function out of the central bank. You el you eliminate that. So it's and and the same thing by the way in Ecuador. Ecuador has a central bank. They just don't have a local money, and the central bank doesn't have any capacity to create local money. So so that is really what Malay is talking about. It, 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 they, they might have a central bank still standing that collects statistics and, and you know, re regulates. Okay, I understand. So it's not the bank. abolishing of the central bank itself that will fight inflation. It's the fact that it's dollarized and then you don't really need right. a central bank right. because it's dollarized. I understand. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, by, by the way, you, you could uh, actually deep six the central bank and just take the institution off the map completely and, and literally put it in a museum. It's, it so happens that the places that are dollarized, we, we've got 33 countries and territories that are dollarized in the world, and, and most of them still retain a, a, a government institution that's called the central bank. But the central bank has no monetary power whatsoever, and and that's what's that's what's needed in Argentina because it's a central bank that is creates all these currency crises that they have in Argentina and create all the instability that they have in Argentina and and you can't run a country that's uh, unstable. Remember my line, David. Stability might not be everything, but everything is nothing without stability. And the only way you get stability in Argentina is, is to dollarize. And, 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 and the reason that I say that, the fundamental reason is this, the concept called enemy. And enemy simply means that there might be a law, but nobody follows the law. So they, they have the enemy disease in Argentina. They, they have a lot of laws, but no, no one follows the laws. 
they're irrelevant. So if you have a law running the central bank, which they do, and no one's following the law and willing to break the law, you, you, you better get rid of that institution. And, and in this case, replace it with a, with a reliable institution, which would, in this case would be the, the Federal Reserve. If they dollarize, the Federal Reserve would be the monetary institution. Is dollarization also linked to austerity? Are those two intertwined? Well, they, they, they are, because dollarization puts a hard budget constraint in the system. And what that means is that you no longer have a central bank that can extend credit to the government, so so the so the government has to behave. I mean, if the government wants to spend money, they, there are only two ways left to do it. They either have to raise taxes or or sell bonds. They can't go to the central bank and sell bonds to the central bank. They either have to sell bonds to the general public or the international market. One of the two. But they can't go over and knock on the door of the governor at Central Bank and say, hey, we, we, we got a great deal to, to sell you here, all these bonds. And of course, they, they usually have the proverbial political gun held at the head of the governor, so he doesn't have much choice. He has to buy the bonds. Well, how, how does he buy the bonds? He prints pesos to buy the bonds. And once, once you do that, once you monetize the fiscal deficit, in Argentina, you, you by printing pesos, you expand the money supply. And, and the money supply, by the way, right now, it's growing at almost a hundred percent per year. To hit their to hit their inflation target of five percent, the money supply should be growing in Argentina at around ten and a half percent, a little over ten and a half percent. But they're growing at at ninety eight percent per year, so so that's why they have so much inflation. And why are they growing the money supply so fast? Because the government goes over to the central bank and says, you know, buy these wonderful bonds that we're selling. So so that's my question. Millet is actually leading the polls right now as we speak. But he has been met with opposition, and I think the opposition doesn't want austerity. Keep in mind, Argentina has been entrenched in socialist policies. They want spending. They want uh, many things provided for by the government. This wouldn't be a very popular policy, would it now, Professor? No, it would be tremendously popular. It, 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 there's no country that's dollarized and that hasn't been tremendously popular there's, there's a lot of yak yak going on prior to dollarization. All kinds of theoretical ideas, conjectures, hypotheses. If you listen to these things, they're so ridiculous that, that a, a grade schooler could critique them. They, they're yeah. a, absolute nonsense. After you dollarize, the question is, after you dollarize, what happens? In Ecuador, they're dollarized since 2000. That's very popular. No, no government, even a even a left wing government of Korea in in Ecuador, he Ecuador under Korea. Korea hated dollarization. Why? Because dollarization puts the politicians in straitjackets. They they can't spend freely. They can't go to the central bank and force the central bank to extend credit to the government. So they. They either have, if they want to spend, they either have to pay for it with taxes or they have to issue bonds to the to the general public or in international markets to do so. So it puts them in a straitjacket. And, and of course, politicians don't like to be in straitjackets. The public loves to have them in straitjackets. The public supports dollarization big time in Ecuador. They support it, and Panama is dollarized. They've been dollarized for over 100 years. The public supports it. El Salvador, dollarized in 2001. The public supports it. Montenegro supports dollarization. or not Now, of course, they, they don't use the German mark anymore. It doesn't exist. They, they use the euro, even though Montenegro is, is not formally part of the eurozone. 
but they use the euro because they're they're dollarized. In in quotes, they're they're dollarized. And the public supports it tremendously. So so you have to think ex ante what happens. You get a lot of people blowing off steam, running their mouths about a subject they know virtually nothing about. And you have a and the press, of course, goes wild with this stuff. The press repeats it over and over and over again. All the nonsense that's coming out, all the so-called opposition to dollarization. I would ask the press, if everyone is so much against dollarization, why does everyone in Argentina voluntarily and spontaneously and unofficially dollarize? Why, why is the biggest stock second only to the United States of, of U.S. dollars in the world lodged in Argentina? Why? If the public is so much against this, why do they all do it? There, there's no pressure by the United States government to do this, to no, expand their sphere no, of influence the, into no, Latin the, America? Not at all. The, the U.S. government is, is out of the picture. We dollarized in Ecuador without any permission at all from the U.S. government. People, uh, we, the same thing in El Salvador. There was no, uh, to officially dollarize Ecuador and officially dollarize El Salvador, there was no official mandate yeah, okay. by the U.S. to do this. To officially use the Deutschmark in 1999 in Montenegro, we we got, we received no permission from the German government or the Bundesbank to do that whatsoever. And in, in fact, the Bundesbank, if anything, did facilitate it because they sent a couple of our loads of of Deutschmark coins down to Montenegro to make certain we had plenty of small change. So, so they accommodated it, but they, they didn't necessarily encourage it or, 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 or officially approve it. It wasn't necessary. And the same thing would happen in Argentina. There's no official blessing that has to be given to dollarization. After all, they're doing it already anyway. The, the, the U.S. government doesn't doesn't have to officially condone the unofficial dollarization that takes place in Argentina on a massive scale right now. OK, so um, we we discussed the benefits of dollarization. I'm reading this article that ex, that does a cost benefit analysis. This was written by two gentlemen. I believe one of them was a, an associate of yours back in the late 90s, Francois Veld. But anyway, it was published by the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, and it's called Dollarization in Argentina. There's a paragraph here that does a cost-benefit analysis, and it says that the cost – I'm just going to read this paragraph, Professor. The cost of unilateral dollarization for Argentina stems mainly from the loss of the foreign reserves that it would have to sell in exchange for dollars. These reserves bear interest and therefore are a source of income for Argentina. This income is called seniorage, and it comes from the structure of any central bank's balance sheet. Its liabilities bear no interest while its assets do. But once Argentina's reserves are replaced by dollar bills, this source of income disappears. How large would that loss be? Well, as of 1997, the reserves amounted to $781 million with an average nominal rate of return of 4.7%. So you're looking at um, a lot of money of potentially interest. Exp in okay, what you've just read is, is absolutely accurate. And, and by the way, the reason they had reserves at that time, they had convertibility and, 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 and nominally convertibility was supposed to require the full coverage of the peso liabilities that had been emitted under, under the convertibility to be covered with US dollar reserves. So that's, that's the reason the reserves were so high then. So that statement is technically correct, but it's one of these irrelevant things. It, this is peanuts. This is peanuts. What, what, what do you get with dollarization? You, you get stability and a much faster rate of growth in the economy. So you, you do lose some senior agent and, unless you come up with some agreement with the United States government to share senior age, which is a possibility, by the way, that, that people don't bring up. And, and, and by the way, the U.S. Joint uh, Committee of the U.S. Congress as many reports on senior age sharing and how that would work, because 
in the late ni- 90s, there was a push at the Joint Economic Committee to to actually a- aggressively facilitate the dollarization of countries. And, and that would have involved senior aid sharing where, where the, the, the U.S. Fed and, and whatever the foreign country dollarizing happened to be would be sharing the senior aid. So, so the senior aid loss in a place like Argentina wouldn't be as great if you had a senior aid sharing thing. That, that never went any place, but it, it is a possibility. Uh, I, 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 I don't think it's something I would be hanging my hat on. The key to dollarization is the benefit cost analysis that was done by my old friend Valde, who, who was a colleague of mine at, at, at Johns Hopkins. It, it, it's kind of a partial, irrelevant analysis. You do lose senior age, but he didn't count all the benefits that you'd get from dollarization. <laughs> And, and and those would swamp. I I, I think he listed the time. yeah. I think he listed the benefits, but you've already covered a lot of them. So um, I didn't I didn't read all okay. the benefits. At, at any at any rate, massively, you you would have to be retarded almost to say that the the benefit cost ratio is less than one for dollarizing a place like Argentina. The the benefits would swamp in any p- potential cost. The only cost being you know. Really, what what is amount what uh, amount to peanuts in terms of senior age loss? It, it wouldn't be very much. And by the way, by the way, the the big gain that you get, you see, to think about this in very practical terms. Okay, you you're gonna you're gonna have a lot faster growth. You're going to eliminate currency crisis crises, which they have constantly in 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 Argentina, but also. You, you will develop a capital market in which you can you can obtain long-term mortgages, 20 or 30 year mortgages to buy houses. So you'd have a boom in the housing industry and the interest rates would be low and stable. This, this is what happens in a place like El Salvador, or even Ecuador or Montenegro. You, 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 you can have long-term mortgages you, you can't get a long-term mortgage in pesos in Argentina. Forget it. It doesn't exist. Is there – okay, so we can extend this analysis to outside Argentina. I know you have some thoughts on Venezuela as well. Uh, first of all, can you explain the mechanism of dollarization? I think uh, – I believe there's two ways that a country can do this. They can either do this unilaterally, proceed on its own, or it can seek some sort of bilateral – uh, arrangement with the United States, which is preferable. Well, uh, if if history is a guide, the, the bilateral thing with the United States that would be the, like the senior age sharing thing, and and this 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 doesn't uh, this this doesn't exist. So, in reality, that's kind of a theoretical option, but in reality, it doesn't exist. So it's a unilateral. Okay, now. Is there a reason a country should pick the dollar in particular as their reserve? I mean, why not? Does it matter where the country is located and where the sphere of influence is in that well, particular area? It, yeah, it, yeah, this, yeah, this is an interesting point because Professor Paul Krugman, uh, you know, famous Nobel laureate, uh, New York Times columnist, of course. Uh, now Krugman. He, he he came out a couple of weeks ago and, and of course, rattled the press. The press got all over the thing because it was Krugman speaking. He said, well, they shouldn't use the U.S. dollar in Argentina. They, they should replace the peso with the euro. And he, and, and he gave some cockamamie explanation for it, which is nonsensical, in fact. It, it, it's it's something right out of a classroom, not, not out of the real world. I'm... I'm a real world applied economist. And what is the rule? My, my preference is to replace a local junk currency with, with whatever people have actually spontaneously replaced it with on their own. And what, what do you find in Argentina? You don't find euros. <laughs> no one's used, no, you know, you can't find a cat or a dog using euros as Krugman recommended. Everyone uses the greenback. 
they've been using the greenback forever in Argentina. This is not something new. So, so the the greenback is the obvious choice in Montenegro, and it was the obvious choice in Ecuador. It was the obvious choice in El Salvador. It's the obvious choice in Latin America because all. Well, then the obvious America, question would be why why go, why bother going through this trouble? Why not just make the greenback legal legal tender and just let the people solve their own problems for yeah, themselves? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's exactly what. Now, let's, that's exactly your. You're following. You're you're a wonderful student. You you've got the picture here. This is exactly what we did in Montenegro. This is exactly the way we did it in Montenegro, David. The German mark, the mighty mark, was was pervasive in Montenegro and the in the rump Yugoslavia. And in fact, all the Balkans, everyone used the mark. You couldn't buy anything of value without a mark. And so what we did in December of 1999, we just made the mark legal tender. Just, just what you said. And boom, the, 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 within, within weeks, maybe days, the Yugoslav dinar just completely disappeared from, from, from the face of Montenegro. The same, the same thing would happen in Argentina, by the way. So what? So there, once there, this happens, there, there, there are more there are more U.S. dollars in Argentina than you can shake a stick at. Well, <laughs> well, they are known for their sticks. That's a that's a tall that's a tall order. Uh, once once you dollarize Argentina, what are you expecting the inflation rate to fall to? Do, I mean, is there some sort of estimate? Do we have a historical precedent? Yeah, yeah, it, 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 uh, for one thing, it would come down to the inflation target in Argentina fairly <laughs> okay. fast. Inflation targets five percent, and and if if my experience is a guide, within thirty days, it it, it would be down at that five percent target or something something in that neighborhood. Inflation in the United States is three point two percent, so it it would start falling to that level because of arbitrage. Mm. Makes sense. So it, it it would happen pretty fast, and. It, it's a it's a little hard to predict with precision, but the tendency would be to go to the rate in the United States. Okay, so you are uh, one of the few that tracks um, hyperinflation worldwide. The Hanky Cruz World Hyperinflation Table ranks, uh, I believe, Venezuela as. Well, I'll let you give the exact number, but it's somewhere near the top in terms of hyperinflation. Do you have the latest reading for us? Yeah, it, yeah, the, the yeah Venezuela's number two. Actually, Zimbabwe is number one. The current uh, inflation rate that I measure in, in Venezuela today is two hundred ninety-seven percent. The Venezuelan Bolivar, by the way, it, it's more or less like the peso in Argentina. Since January first of two thousand twenty-two, it's lost eighty-five point six percent of its value. So it's basically worthless. Okay, so um, what's the solution here? Not, dollarization. Not, 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 well, no, a cousin of dollarization is is I, I'm a, advising uh, one of the candidates for president, uh, Roberto Enriquez. Roberto Enriquez has embraced the Hanky plan, and the Hanky plan one one component of one of the big the big three components. One of those is a currency board, uh, which, by the way, I, I proposed when I was President Caldera's advi advisor in Venezuela in 1995-96. So, so we've we've dusted off that proposal, and and, and in this case, I say a cousin of dollarization because the Bolivar would still exist under Roberto Enrique's plan, but he also would do away with the central bank, meaning that he would take away the right for the central bank to produce bolivars. The currency board would issue bolivars, and the bolivars would trade at a fixed exchange rate to the U.S. dollar. They'd be backed up with 100% with U.S. dollar reserves, and the bolivar would become a clone of the dollar. It wouldn't be the dollar, but it would be a clone of the U.S. dollar. And that 
would be a system, by the way, that is the same in every way from the dollarized system, except there would be a bolivar. It would be backed 100% with U.S. dollar reserves. And those U.S. dollar reserves, back to your Chicago Fed 1999 report, they would earn interest and seniorage in that currency board. Currency boards always make a profit. They earn seniorage. So, so the, the only difference between a dollarized country and, and a currency board country is the local, there would be a local currency and the assets backing that currency would earn interest, meaning seniorage would, or profits would be earned. So that's what we're proposing in Venezuela. If, if Roberto Enriquez ends up being the next president of Venezuela, they will have a currency board. And that is the basis of it. I, I mean, I, 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 Kurt Schuller and I have written a book about this, by the way, and it, it's been published in uh, Venezuela by Sidisi. It's you can get it. You, you can get it online at no charge. One of, the, one of those great free books. Venezuela has many problems besides just hyperinflation. Well, one could argue there are symptoms of hyperinflation, but the most obvious one is that uh, there's not enough food for everybody. This article from Reuters from March, 50% of Venezuelans uh, live in poverty, according to a national poll. They can't even afford food. Now... Is this a problem that we can fix with monetary policy, or do we have to back up and do some more cleaning here? Well, monetary policy lays the groundwork for what what would be an economic boom. So the economy, the economy would start growing. So that that's good. But but the main thing, it would produce stability. And remember, stability might not be everything, but everything is nothing without stability. So. So the, the other two aspects of the plan hanky that Roberto Enriquez is putting forth is you have to do something with the oil reserves. You have to privatize them. Right now, these oil reserves are the largest in the world in Venezuela. And, and the depletion rate of the state-owned oil company, the rate at which they're using up these reserves it, their, their depletion rate is a tenth of 1% per year. So, so they're, they're, they're producing oil at such a s- slow rate that it would take 569.4 years to deplete half the reserves. So at a, at a 10% discount rate, these reserves are wor- they're worthless. They're not worth anything. They're like stranded assets, zombie assets. So well, if you look at a, at, at a normal oil company like Exxon, the depletion rate isn't a tenth of 1% per year. It, it's 6.5% per year. So it takes 10 and a quarter years to deplete the reserves that Exxon has. Instead of taking 569 years, it takes 10 and a half years. So at 10 and a half, 10% interest rate, the reserves Exxon has are worth something. So we would privatize the reserve. So that that would be a big plus, a huge increase in, in uh, the value of assets in in Venezuela, and and that would be a, a, a huge poverty reduction mechanism. The other thing is agriculture. Agriculture has a huge potential. This is a third part of Plan Hanky. Part one currency board. Part two, privatize the oil reserves. Part three, fix the agricultural sector. Now, the agricultural sector, it's only operating at about 5%, only about 5% of the agricultural lands are actually being used properly in Venezuela at present. So that's, that's one reason people are so poor, mm. so, so much poverty. One reason for that is that credit, they, they can't get credit and agriculture runs on credit. Now the credit system would start running very well with the currency board system. That you get stability, the banks would be able to extend credit, agriculture would pick up on that front. 
There's also something called a seed law in, a, in Venezuela. And the, and the seed law prohibits the use of genetically modified seed corn, for example, and crops. Those are, those are illegal. It's like the madness that we witnessed in Sri Lanka when agriculture creek collapsed in Sri Lanka last year. So we, we would uh, we, we would get rid of that plant hanky. Plant hanky would get rid of this pro prohibition on GM of crops. And the credit wow. system would be opened up and and, and, the, and there are other aspects to fixed agriculture that are in the plant hanky. But but basically we'd get the oil sector running, we'd get ag running, we'd have stability, low inflation, and and the place would take off. I know you like my uh, theoretical thought exercises, so here's one. Uh, if we were to abolish the Federal Reserve here in the United States, would that, going forward, prevent any sort of inflation? <laughs> well, now, I, I, I must say you're getting more extreme. I, I, you know, the, the, the climate in Vancouver must be doing something. <laughs> uh, uh, it. it it, it it could it could be done you you could go back to free banking with you know this we, we we didn't have a central bank in the united states until 1913 so if we had free banking and competitive currencies uh it, it it's possible it it is a hypothetical but 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 it but it isn't it isn't shall we say way out there because actually the United States didn't have a central bank, didn't have a Fed until 1913. So what, what would be a, a system in which you operated without a central bank? Well, you could go back to the, you know, something like Scottish free banking, where, where banks issued their own money. I mean, right now, by the way, in a, in a way, this this isn't a complete stretch because in, in right now, about eighty two percent of of all the money supply measured by M two that's created in the United States is actually produced by commercial banks privately. It's not produced by the Fed. The the the, the so 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 even right now we we are operating in a system where. Most of the broad money, broadly measured, held by the non-bank public in the United States, as well as every other country, is actually produced by private commercial banks. So, 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 so your hypothetical. Uh, once you start digging into it and so forth, it doesn't. It, it's not as far out as 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 one might think, you know, in, in many respects. But I, I guess the question would be, is free banking um, more conducive to price stability? Well, if you, if you read Friedrich von Hayek's treatise on competitive currencies, the, the answer would be yes. It, it, yes, is, is the answer. In other words, the, the, the general thesis thrown up by Hayek and the Austrians. This is in broad strokes now, David, at 30,000 feet. We're not, we're not getting into technical seminar or anything like that. But, but the, broad, the broad strokes are that central banks are fundamentally big destabilizers. And, and if you had private free banking with competitive currencies regimes, uh, you, 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 would, you would witness more stability. Now, I can say one thing, that, that's certainly true in emerging market countries. That, that's why I concluded a number of years ago that at least there, was a, there were at least 90 central banks that should be abolished and dollarization should occur and the local currency should be done away with. And, and you should couple that with a competitive currency regime. Now, that's what they did in El Salvador, by the way. If you look at the way El Salvador operates, they officially dollarized in 2001, but the law also accompanies that official dollarization with 
a competitive currency provision indicating that anyone can is free to denominate contracts, whether, whether they be wage contracts or any other kind of contract, in any currency they, they wish to denominate it in. The only thing that is dollarized in the legal tender sense and used for paying taxes is in, in 2001 when they put this in is the U.S. dollar. Uh, final question. This has been a very thorough discussion. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we've been talking about dollarization. On the other side of the spectrum, people have been talking about de-dollarization, in particular from the East, from perhaps the BRICS nations. Are you seeing any signs that may suggest that other countries as well are interested in this and are on, on pers in pursuit of this? Yes. Yes, there, there, there is a lot of there, there's a lot of talk and a, and a lot of material in the press on this. But if you actually look at what's going on, it's kind of small potatoes. For example, a couple of weeks ago, India, in, in a move to try to de-dollarize, their central bank said they were they were wanted to encourage the settlement of trade transactions between the United Arab Emirates and India to be done in rupee, uh, the Indian rupee. And the reason, yeah. the reason for that, of course, they have a, India has a big trade deficit with the UAE. But, but the problem is, number one, the amounts would have been small. But number two, as I did, said in an interview someplace else, I said, who the hell would want an Indian rupee? Uh, you know, it, it, it's, you know, you, you want a Russian ruble? <laughs> yeah, you know, now, 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 let's let's talk about how this could be done. This BRICS thing, if you if you actually get in, the the only way BRICS could ever do anything, and, and by the way, China talks all the time about de-dollarization. So India is talking about it, China is talking about it, Russia is talking about it, uh, Brazil is talking about it. Lot, lots of talk, and, and small time bilateral deals. Wait a minute, how, how is China going to de-dollarize? Their entire currency well, is a managed float. Yeah, so so here, here here's, here's if BRICS issued a currency, I've suggested this and written about it, they, they could do it. And and the only way they could become a, a, an interesting challenger for the U.S. dollar, for example, and, and, and by the way, the U.S. dollar is, has been highly weaponized with sanctions, used as sanctions. So it has some vulnerabilities, the U.S. dollar, due, due to this the stupidity of sanctioning and weaponizing it. But let's go to BRICS. How would they do it? They would do a, a gold-backed currency board. They, they would issue a BRIC, that, that would be the currency, B-R-I-C. I'd call it a BRIC. And, and 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 to put glue among the bricks, you would you would do it gold back, and and you you, you would allow the brick to trade at a fixed exchange rate for for a certain quantity of gold. Okay, and you would back the bricks that you were being issued, hundred percent with gold reserves. So the brick would become a clone of gold. It would become as good as gold, and and if they did that with a currency board, a transparent currency board, located, I would locate that in Switzerland, by the way, governed under Swiss law, with a with a board of five board of directors, two of them from BRIC countries and three outside BRIC. So you'd make the thing completely transparent. The BRIC the BRIC would be the currency. It would be traded at a fixed exchange rate under currency board law and rules for a fixed quantity of gold, and the brick would be as good as gold. That 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 thing would be a challenger. So, Professor, uh, let's end on gold. You have a sentiment score for us, the Hanky Kaufness Gold Sentiment Score that we can access online. I'll put the link in the description. Do we have a do we have a latest reading for us, Professor? An update. We, we look with Abe Kaufman and I uh, through, uh, you know, with, with doing it by computers, not manually reading all the articles. The computer reads all the articles 
coming out every hour on Google and determine whether the articles are bullish or bearish. And, and, and we get a sentiment score. We, we, we measure the temperature, the, the barometric pressure, if you will, in the market every hour. And we come up with a score. This can go all very bullish would be a plus 10, very bearish, minus 10. And if, it's, if the score would be very bullish, that would mean the following, that we could anticipate that the market would revert back to neutrality or maybe even go bearish. So if you had a long position, you'd want to liquidate it or, and institute a short position. On the other side, if, if we have an extreme minus 10 bearish reading, we would expect a reversion back to neutrality or bullish coming in the coming hours and so you, if you had a short position, you'd want to liquidate that and uh, institute a, a long position and, and, and ride the wave up. We, we have algorithms connected to these ten sentiment scores, uh, David, and they, they've been trading very well. Depending on which algorithm, the annualized rate of return is running between about 30 and 50 percent per year. Well, thank you, Professor, for a very thorough discussion on dollarization. Uh, make sure to follow Steve on Twitter, link down below. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.